So thank you very much, uh, Marina and Matt, for the invitation. Uh, exciting to be televised in many countries, I guess. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you is about the dual intragastric balloon. Uh, it's one of the technologies that is available for um, weight loss. These are my disclosures. And, and just to make sure, I'm going to just present the data and the device. You know, I do have a... Uh, some, some consulting, consulting agreements with Reshape, Reshape Medical, Medical, which is the maker of this balloon, but I also have consulting agreements with other balloon companies. So this is the dual intragastric balloon. And this balloon uh, has been approved by the FDA in July 28 last year for patients with BMI of 30 to 40 with at least one comorbidity. It's not intended to replace or compete with surgery. It is a temporary device for six months. And it is an outpatient ambulatory procedure, and it is considered to be a jump start for a good diet and exercise program. Now, the concept of two balloons, why, why is that? Why do we need two balloons? Well, one of those is the safety issue. If one balloon end up getting ruptured, inside they have saline with methylene blue. And what happens is this is an image of the two balloons inflated, and this is an image of one balloon deflated and the other one maintaining that balloon in the stomach. The patient will notice that they have some blue or green urine, and they will alert us to uh, remove that balloon. Second feature of Y2 balloons is that it can distribute that uh, volume in within the stomach. So 900 cc's distributed in two, 450 cc's two balloons. The other feature is uh, it conforms to the stomach curvature by this design of the two balloons, and so it allows a little bit more stability and potentially can allow more tolerance on the patient side. The placement of this balloon is done endoscopically. Usually we put the scope and verify that the stomach is uh, okay, you don't have any ulcers or no significant heart or hernia. We slide the wire uh, down to the first portion of the duodenum, and through the wire we slide the catheter with the two balloons. They lay down in the greater curvature, and under direct visualization we inflate one balloon and then the other balloon. This uh, inflation is done with a special pump that it allows you to uh, inflate it quickly. And then uh, the attachment uh, from the introducer is being uh, removed. So this is a video of how the wire is being placed in the first portion of the duodenum. Uh, you remove the scope, and then through the wire, you slide the balloon device. And then under direct visualization, you can start inflating first the proximal balloon and then the distal balloon. This is just the placement of the balloon uh, in the greater curvature. The wire is removed, and then the inflation um, start happening after that. You're going to see that uh, each balloon uh, is being inflated. And why first the first one? Because if you inflate first the distal, it kind of pushes back up into the EG junction. So you want it to make sure that the first one is not inflated into the esophagus or staying in the stomach. And then the distal one is much easier just to visualize and inflate it uh, then. When both balloons are inflated, uh, you're going to notice that the capacity of the stomach is pretty much reduced as uh, both balloons just occupy pretty much... Uh, the body and the fundus of the stomach, and then uh, the introducer uh, is being removed. So the removal procedure is also done endoscopically. We go in with a uh, suction catheter and puncture each balloon. Each balloon is being aspirated completely. After each balloon is aspirated, what we do is get a rat tooth grasper and then uh, take a bite on each balloon to ventilate the whatever air gets tra uh, trapped there on that uh, area. And then we use a snare to trap uh, the proximal tip of the balloon and then remove it that way. With the snare itself, pretty safe because as long as you have it around the tip, you know, it will not get detached. This is a video of the removal. So we're looking at the balloons and the suction catheter, it punctures the balloon in a perpendicular fashion, um, slide the catheter in, uh, put it on wall suction pretty much, you know, until uh, the balloon is completely deflated. And you repeat the same thing on the distal balloon. Uh, so when the two balloons are deflated, then we go in with a uh, rat tooth grasper and then take a little bite of each balloon uh, to help to ventilate whatever air gets trapped while you're manipulating the, the device. So this is the, the second balloon being deflated. You're going to see there uh, the little bite uh, with the rat tooth grasper. And then we're going to lasso the proximal tip with the snare 
we like to use a large uh, snare so it can allow us to uh, carefully manipulate that and then uh, it's not very complicated. Sometimes that tip goes up into the fundus, so you have to push it down into the body of the stomach and then you just pull it out. Um, so what is the data available? So the main data available on this balloon comes from the reduced pivotal trial that was published in SORT uh, last year. Uh, this study uh, is the one that was submitted to the FDA. It was uh, uh, done in eight clinical sites in the United States. You see there the investigators in the location. And it's a randomized double-blinded sham control comparison. It's level one evidence comparing the balloon plus diet and exercise with a group just with diet and exercise. It was done on patients with BMI of 30 to 40 with at least one comorbidity as the FDA required to have one comorbidity with monthly, monthly counseling, and we assess the weight loss, adverse events. Uh, so this is the design of the trial, randomization into two groups. Now the patients that had the balloon at the end of the 24 weeks were unblinded, the balloon was removed, and they were followed for another 48 weeks. The patients that did not have the balloon were offered either to exit the study or to continue with a balloon and follow for an additional 48 weeks. There were two co-primary endpoints, one to see if there was a difference of more than 7.5% excess weight loss in between the two groups, favoring the balloon group. And the second co-primary endpoint was to see if the number of responders on the balloon group was more than 35% of those patients. Uh, responders was defined as more than 25% excess weight loss. There were 531 insertion and retrieval procedures and all uh, those insertions were uh, successful except for one that um, uh, show a lot of uh, decrease in the oxygen saturation and decided to abort the procedure. The mean duration of insertion was eight minutes. The mean duration of removal was 14 minutes. All the devices were removed endoscopically. There were three serious adverse events on this trial, one patient with pneumonia, one patient with a contained perforation in the cervical esophagus, and one patient with an esophageal uh, mucosal tear. You, you can, can see, see here the, the, the patient, patient with esophageal mucosal tear. Uh, the first co-primary endpoint was met as uh, the difference in between the two groups was uh, exceeded that 7.5%. It was uh, in the range of 15.6%. And also the second uh, co-primary endpoint was met as more than 35% of the patients exceeding that responder group, which it was 54% uh, of those uh, patients. We also looked at weight loss maintenance on the additional 48 weeks, and uh, we saw that the patients maintained an average 65% of the excess weight loss that they had on the first 24 weeks. 36 patients actually uh, maintained uh, more than 25% excess weight loss, and 25% of the patients actually lost more weight during those uh, additional 24 weeks. We look at uh, laboratory uh, comorbid benefit uh, with hemoglobin A1C, lipids, blood pressure, and all those uh, show a significant improvement after the balloon placement. And we also look at quality of life. And quality of life on the balloon patients did show improvement even after the balloon was removed. 64% of the patients that had the balloon said they were repeated, and 78% said they were recommended to a friend. In regards to symptoms, we did see that most of the symptoms happened in, in the first three days. After the first week, most of the nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain kind of wind down, and most of the symptoms were categorized as mild to moderate by the patients. There were no deaths, migrations, or obstructions, or surgery required on any of these patients, and most of the adverse events were GI symptoms that occur in the first 30 days. As you can see there, the majority were nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. And, and there was, was a high incidence of gastric ulcerations, and I'm going to touch on this issue a little bit. This is an x-ray that shows the two balloons, and you can see that you can barely see the balloons without contrast, but if you put contrast, you can see the two balloons inflated very easily. This is a balloon deflated, uh, and this is an endoscopic balloon deflation uh, with a lot of BSOR, proximal balloon deflated. Uh, sometimes we saw this uh, cover micro... Uh, microbial biofilm around the balloon that is common in some of the intragastric balloons. Sometimes it happens. And sometimes we saw air in the balloon. Um, and you can see that on the x-ray. So now in regards to the ulcers, uh, we start seeing a high frequency of very small ulcerations at the level of the incisura. So it was requested to the FDA that the device was modified. So that tip that was touching the incisura was a smooth and so 107 patients were treated with a modified device, and the ulcer rate dropped from 39% to 
as you can see here on this graphic, and the size of the ulcer dropped from 16 millimeters to 8 millimeters. And what we're talking about is this type of ulcerations. You know, it's a very small, superficial uh, ulceration on the level of the incisura. Patients that had ulcerations were followed with endoscopy, and all of those were healed after the balloon was removed. So in conclusion, I think the dual uh, balloon uh, showed to be a reversible intervention on patients with BMI of 30 to 40 with at least uh, one comorbidity that did not qualify or are not ready for surgery. They have uh, good weight loss in 24 weeks, uh, the exceeded 2.3 times the weight loss that the diet group had, and they were able to maintain 65% of that excess weight loss in the additional 24 weeks. There was a significant benefit, at least on the lab comorbidities, and, and I, I think, think the, the symptoms, symptoms uh, can be treated and they're manageable, they're mild to moderate. There's a small benign ulceration that occurs in about 10% of the patients. Now, what about the data outside of the United States? So we have data from uh, Spain. Uh, this is the only published data on, on the dual balloon. This comes from Lopez Nava, who she has a lot of experience with different balloon devices. So he published 60 patients with an average BMI of 39, and he had one patient that had an early retrieval. You, you can, can see, see here, 60, 60 patients, the excess weight loss that he documented is 47%. The patients with BMI less than 40 had better weight loss than the BMIs more than 40, and females had better weight loss than the male patients. When he followed those patients, even uh, 12 months after the balloon was removed, he was able to maintain 98% of the weight loss. So that speaks about those programs that are very good at not only uh, managing the balloon, but also maintaining the weight loss. Now, now, one thing, thing that, that I wanted to touch uh, about the removals, in the United States, States we did, and in, in any of the balloon devices, we did not have a lot of experience, so we did see a lot of early removals from quote-unquote intolerance, and we saw that also on the other balloon that is approved by the FDA, the single uh, balloon. But you can see here, this is just a comparison of the eight sites in the United States and the percentage of early removals. You can see there the variations from 4% to even 40% of those patients had the early balloon removals. When you compare that to Lopez Nava data, it's only 2%. So I think there's something to do with the learning curve on us clinicians and patients, how to manage them and how to control that early intolerance on those devices. Thank you very much.